I'm holding in my hand. It's called Peace Action, Past, Present, and Future, which was written for our 50th William Sloan Coffin annual meeting for our 50th anniversary. And I would like to say that Cora Weiss, who's in our audience, was our very first recipient of the William Sloan Coffin Award. <laughs> the foreword was written by none other than our Congresswoman, Barbara Lee. An excerpt from the foreword is going to be read by my friend and fellow granny, Viney Burroughs. Viney Burroughs is an actress since childhood. She has worked with many major actors, too numerous to mention, but more important, she has been an activist her entire adult life. Viney is the permanent representative of WIDF, Women's International Democratic Federation at the UN. And I now give you my friend and troublemaker, Viney Burroughs. Thank you. I do have a slight feeling of trepidation because I am doing the words of uh, Barbara Lee and she is sitting right there in front of me. <laughs> but here goes. This is part of the foreword. While growing up as a child, I did not want to be a member of Congress. What motivated me was not so much to be part of the system, but to change the system. While a student at Mills College in Oakland, California, I was a young, single mother on public assistance, and like many young people today, I was not registered to vote. One of my professors gave us an assignment to work on one of the presidential campaigns. When I looked at the white men running in 1972, <laughs> Nixon, Humphrey, Wallace, Muskie, McGovern, I told my professor, you're going to have to flunk me. <laughs> because there is no way I'm going to work for one of them. None of them cares about me. They aren't going to take on the real issues that matter to people like me. Well, that's when I heard about Shirley Chisholm. Oh. The first black woman elected to Congress, and she was talking about ending the war in Vietnam, about poverty, about civil rights, about women's rights, and she was running for president. Wow. So I said, I've got to find out more about this woman. I was president of the Black Student Union, and I invited Representative Shirley Chisholm to speak to us. And I went up and I asked her, what could I do to help with her campaign? And she looked at me and she said, well, <laughs> the first thing you must do, my dear, is register to vote. <laughs> it sounds common sense enough that if you care about what happens in your country or in the world, you can't sit back and let someone else make the decisions. If you don't like the system, then you have got to work to change the system. Peace Action represents what's motivated me to join Shirley's campaign and get involved in politics in the first place. The desire not only to advocate for progressive politics, but to change the way the political system works. Now my first encounter with Peace Action, then SANE, was in the mid-1970s when I was an intern for the newly elected anti-war representative, Ron Dellums. Oh, a lot has changed over the years, including the merger between SANE and the Nuclear Freeze 
which led to the formation of Peace Action. What impressed me about the organization then, as today, was that it harnessed people's spirit and idealism, not simply into acts of protest, but into effective action. Now, in my home state of California, Peace Action organizers are out knocking on doors, making phone calls, organizing events across the states just about every night. They help people realize their power when they act collectively, and they make sure that politicians understand that when it comes to issues of war and peace, they have to answer to an informed and organized electorate. Now in Washington, D.C., Peace Action brings together congressional staff and representatives of progressive foreign policy organizations to strategically plan and work together more effectively. Peace Action meets directly with members of Congress to collaborate on legislative strategy for ending the occupation in Iraq, changing U.S. foreign policy to cooperation and human rights, and ridding the world of nuclear weapons. Peace action also influences public policy, not only through the media, but also in mass protest, in town hall meetings, and on the internet. Peace action not only talks to members of Congress, but helps elect candidates who understand and care about peace issues. It educates millions of voters in every election and helps to elect progressive members of Congress who join me on the Progressive Caucus, which I currently co-chair. Now, I believe that members of Congress should be hearing more from constituents and peace activists than from lobbyists for the weapons or oil industry. Here, here. See, peace action is a model when it comes to making that happen. And that is how we will and can achieve global security, peace, and justice. It is an honor for me to contribute some thoughts to this book's foreword. I salute peace action's past work, and I am proud to continue working with peace action in order to ensure a more peaceful future for our children and our grandchildren. Your words. Fine, thank you so much. Brilliant as always. My name is Cheryl Wirtz. I'm the chair of the board of Peace Action of New York State. And you know that ridiculous expression, a man who needs no introduction? Well, I feel at home. It is true, I've been with Peace Action before, and I think I'm entitled to be, in some way, a part of your uh, community of conscience. Yeah. I interviewed all the, I interviewed Ron Dellums, I interviewed Dr. Spock. I remember Dr. Spock had more money than God. He, <laughs> baby and child care sold more than, uh, than the Bible. <laughs> And here he was with the, remember the, the vest and the patrician bearing, you know, that he had. And he's going to jail. And they put him in a cell where the toilet sticks out from the wall. He said you had to kick the wall to get the toilet to flush. I had never seen this kind of moral courage. This was rather early in my own career, and I watched a multimillionaire go to jail. That was sane, and that was, uh, those were the people who, on whose shoulders we stand with peace now. So, I'm trying to legitimize my presence here. I want to take you back to October 2002. That happens to be nine years ago this week. Congress is debating the Iraq War resolution or whatever it was. It wasn't constitutional. Bush wants Congress's permission to invade Iraq if he has to. N n none of the constitutional mandate of only Congress. And this is okay with Congress because they don't want the job anyway. It's a third rail issue. If they're wrong, 
they may lose their job. So they essentially say, here, Mr. President, if you have to, go ahead. If he goes ahead and it doesn't work, they're able to say, well, he said, I thought. So it's a CYA maneuver on the part of incumbents. And, so, and remember now, 2002, October, we're, we're less than, uh, we're 13 months after the towers. Um, the towers were September in the preceding year. Generals were going, remember the generals, the experts on CNN and all? They were, we know now, they were going to Rumsfeld's office, briefed, <clears throat> and went right to CNN and MSNBC. A magnificently managed uh, program that we can call the politics of fear. The White House Iraq group, WIG, created talking points for all the members of Congress. A smoking gun will become, and they read them. This is one of the most important quotes in the history of Congress. The longer we wait, the more dangerous he becomes. <laughs> Saddam is coming, he's outside your room, he's under your bed. I mean, the bloodlust at this time, I, you know, only 23 senators voted no. On the invade, 77 senators said, invade Iraq. We have over 4,000 Americans dead, over 4 million refugees, the country's in ruins, untold thousands of Iraqis killed. And this, this president, Bush, in 2002, took this nation by the ear and sent it right into the sword. There were a few who said no. Yes. And when you consider the pressure in October 2000, the bloodlust, almost everybody wanted to bomb something. And there were 23 senators stood up and said no, including one Republican, Lincoln Chafee, Chafee of Rhode Island, who lost his seat at the next election. People who voted no didn't love America. They were, uh, you know, they didn't understand geopolitical. They didn't respect the troops. How can you, how can you say no when the president, eh? Here is a piece of the movie we did which featured the, the debate on both the House and the Senate. It's only two minutes long, and the last voice and person you'll see on this film is uh, our honoree. Sound. Sound. If I had not been one who was given intelligence briefings, I may well have opposed this resolution. This state, all the power, long run, the economy, the right, brilliant people all. We look at the vice president, we look at the secretary of state, we look at the secretary of defense. This is as glittering an array of talent as any president has ever assembled to invite on foreign policy. Indeed, I believe they have a plan, Mr. Allen. I, Mr. Allen, I, Mr. Baucus, I. The threat posed by Iraq grows with each passing day. Mr. Bond, I. The danger that grows every day. Mr. Bennett, I. Each day that goes by, he becomes more dangerous. More by our hands. Every day. So I'm just saying grows strong. His capabilities become better. Mr. Bond, I. Every day. So I'm just saying build more chemical and biological weapons. The longer we wait, the more dangerous he Oh, not since Hitler and not since Hitler <coughs> have we seen so much evil. The God of the 20th century and our Hitler. I believe the next century is done in the next. The God of the same. The God of the same. Our weapon. Far, far more attention to the whole world that Hitler and Kelly is that. You can have a nuclear weapon with less than you. They could have a nuclear weapon. In less than a year. And then you're wrapping the state are longer than a few months. A matter of a few months. Mr. Bond, hi. Uh, Mr. Bro, hi. Uh, Mr. Brown, hi. Uh, Mr. Bunny, hi. Uh, Mr. Burr, uh, Mr. Hamm, hi. Uh, Ms. Kemp, hi. Uh, Mrs. Parker, Mr. Parker, hi. Uh, uh, Wait! Three weeks before election, 
seems to be an odd time to be authorizing war. We ought to hear that the, what the real reality is if the American people ought to understand that the parents of those servicemen ought to understand what their children are going to be faced with. I urge you to oppose this question war. Listen, listen. And it's not in our national security interest. We have options and we have obligations to pursue them. There's my favorite time. The House and the, the Assembly and the Senate of California and in Congress since 1998. This is not a fly-by-night politician here. She obviously cares deeply. She's on the street a lot. She gets down from the air-conditioned office and she gets and takes care of the people who are the most powerless in her district. I am honored to present Barbara Lee. First of all, good evening. And let me say, Phil, what, what a wonderful introduction. What a spirited and humbling introduction. And also, I just have to uh, say to you, I, I grew up watching the Phil Donahue show. <laughs> you were part of our family. My mother used to try to make me do my homework and study and do all the things I, I should have been doing. But uh, I had to watch, and now the Phil Donahue show. <laughs> well, so, and you turned out anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So let me, first of all, just um, thank you so much. You've been such a cons consistent voice uh, against war and for peace. Last time I saw Phil, I think it was on the steps of the Capitol with uh, Senator Byrd when you yeah. were putting together this film. And so it's just wonderful to see you again. And I'm glad you're still on the front and, and moving forward with us. So give Phil another round of applause because it's just really so wonderful for your support. Fight the good fight no matter where it is and who's engaged in it. Let me also say to Bonnie, listen, that was to listen to you read my words, I, I tell you, I gotta ask you to travel with me a little bit, please. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I, I really uh, felt your spirit, first of all, and just want to thank you for translating what I was trying to write. Into, um, into speech and into language and into power. I mean, I never could have written it as powerful as you spoke it tonight. And so thank you so much. And thank you for staying the course, Viney. Give Viney another round of applause, because it's so good to see you, my sister. So good to see you. And to Carol, and to Alicia, and to the committee, to the entire Peace Action family, I just have to uh, thank you, first of all, for what you do each and every day. Thank you so much for, for really, uh, in spite of the odds, staying the course. It, it's so important, your work, uh, even more important today. And you have built this organization, all of you, you continue to support this organization. And I've got to tell you, it's an organization that Every member of Congress, Peace Action, uh, should get to know if they don't know them. But uh, the report card that, that you all do, I'm going to tell you, many organizations do report cards. The two that I really care about and I want to see an A there is, is Peace Action and, and Labor. And so it is just a remarkable instrument to use in terms of ensuring elected officials' accountability. Also, I just have to mention um, Peace Action in my district with, with John and Rebecca. Uh, they do an awesome job and, you know, they stay the course and they make sure that I stay on point. And so this is not a, a Barbara Lee award and I accept this very humbly, uh, but I accept it on behalf of my Peace Ac Action chapter in my district and on behalf of all of my constituents. So thank you so much. And to Cora and to Peter, let me just say how wonderful it is to see you still working for peace and justice. We met, this goes back to the same freeze days when I worked for Ron. You know, I've been to their home many, many times. We worked on many, many 
issues and struggles together and you're still there fighting, fighting for us all. Thank you, Cora. Thank you. And Danny's doing great. Their son I work with in DC and he keeps us on. And whenever there's an issue I need to know about or need to understand more clearly, I go right to Danny, even though he works for my good friend, Congressman Miller. Danny's all of our staff. So all of our staff, so thank you again. Tell him. I, tell him, yeah. I Actually, I just saw him the other day. We were talking about something in the subway, moving back and forth from the Capitol. He's doing a fine job. Reverend Coffin, to receive this honor, um, Cora, and those who have received it before, it is really very humbling. I had the privilege uh, to meet him when he was senior pastor at Riverside. I listened to him uh, preach. Uh, on behalf of the plight of the poor, American militarism, uh, tolerance for other faiths, uh, and nuclear disarmament. Uh, as an admirer of Dr. King, he was really a true believer in the power of civil disobedience, uh, truly believed in that, and, and that power to bring about social and political change, which is uh, still growing, thank God, with uh, Occupy Wall Street, right around the corner. So I know he is. Smiling. I know he is smiling. So this is just really, really um, a special moment for me. It, it really is. Riverside Church, Reverend Coffin, all of those who uh, spoke and pastored the congregation and the entire community and really the entire country, uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude. And so, yes, give, give the entire Riverside family a round of applause because they really do um, set the standard for many, many uh, faiths and for many, many churches throughout the country. I uh, want to say just a few words about our current work for peace and justice uh, in this Congress, which, as you know, is uh, dominated by uh, Tea Party Republicans, but that's going to be over pretty soon. <laughs> Thank you. Whether the Occupy movement has a leader and agenda, which I don't think it needs, I think it's helping push them out, really, the, t the Tea Party Republicans. Uh, so let me just talk about three things very quickly. Working uh, for economic justice, finally putting a stop to these uh, wars without end, and they are wars without end and significantly realigning our nation's spending priorities for true peace and security for all. Reverend Coffin said, and I went back and found uh, one of his quotes, he said, there are three kind of patriots, two bad and one good. The bad ones are uncritical lovers and the loveless critics. Good patriots carry on a lover's quarrel with their country, a reflect, reflection of God's lover quarrel with all over the world. That was in his words. And so I'm inspired by the lover's quarrel of the Occupy movement. I'm inspired. Their continued peaceful struggle, and yes, I'm from Oakland and you know our occupiers and our protesters have been engaged in a peaceful occupation. But this struggle is exactly what uh, Reverend Coffin was talking about. This is a movement that's really challenging uh, the status quo and working for economic justice for 99% of Americans and for people across the globe. And so as it relates to Oakland, I had to call the mayor, who's a good friend of mine, and I shared my outrage about the police brutality in my wonderful hometown of Oakland, California. And my thoughts go out tonight, and we all have to think about, even though he's improving some, uh, our uh, Iraq War veteran, Scott Olson, who completed two tours of duty, mind you, and returned home only to be injured uh, in my district in a peaceful protest. Mm. So peacemaking is not accomplished merely by, uh, on a global level, on a macro level, by cutting the defense budget, which we must do. We must also work against uh, the use of violence or the threat of violence 
as the primary means of resolving conflicts in our fight for justice in our communities and throughout the world. Violence really should not be an option. And the example of Oakland, I think, really drives home this point. Because violence begets violence, as we know. And people, the, the police force overreacted. It was a disproportionate response to what was taking place there. And we can't have pay, peace if we face uh, police brutality, economic injustice, just as we cannot have peace if we are at war. Uh, and peace action, uh, New York State, um, I, know, I know you all are leading uh, in stopping these wars because we must end these wars. And that means we must end them. We must end them. And now we all know that, and, and thank you for helping us push the White House, because it wouldn't have happened without peace action to bring our troops home by the end of December. That's a major, major victory, a major victory. Because you heard the noise. They were talking about keeping more troops. But because of what we have done together, the majority of our troops will be home. But as Cora and I were talking about, we've got to talk about what's happening with the 50,000 contractors yes. that are staying there. Yes. What's happening there? So this ain't over. And also, are they going to comply with, and I know you all helped me so many times, with the law that I authored saying we shall have no permanent bases in Iraq. That is the law of the land. That is the law of the land. The law of the land. And so we've got to check this out now, and we should be proud of this victory now, although we should have never been in Iraq, because I was in those briefings, Phil, the same as they were, and how they concluded what they said is beyond me, <laughs> okay? Because it just wasn't true. And so we have to um, understand that this war should not have been fought. And you helped to end it as quickly as this and the previous administration would end it. But now we've got to talk about ending the war in Afghanistan. Yeah. We've got to end it. And as you know, I voted against that terrible resolution right after the horrific attacks of 9-11. This was on September 14th when Democrats and Republicans negotiated an authorization to use force and that resolution said the president is authorized to use force against any nation, organization, individual connected to or part of or even tangentially connected to 9-11. And there was, this was one of the broadest resolutions that we have ever seen. And I tried to get them to change that resolution and it didn't work because you know how horrible that moment was. Well, I ended up being the only one to vote against that resolution. And let me tell you, the only one. And now, 10 years later, you know, this is still a war without end. And so we must uh, demand that we begin to end this war in Afghanistan, and much quicker than the White House's timeline. Yes. Much quicker, much quicker. And I have to say again, thank you to Peace Action for helping me on my resolution. And we're building support for this. And what it says, each time I introduce it and get a vote on it, we build, I think I, last time I got 100 votes that say, no more funding for Afghanistan at all for combat operations. Cut the funding, stop the funding. Except to protect our troops and contractors and to bring them home. Says, Mr. President, we're going to give you the resources to protect everyone, but to get them out of there. Because there's no military solution in Afghanistan, and, and you know that. And so I'm very proud to say the last vote on this resolution started probably with 10 a couple of years ago. Now we had 100 votes. And that's because of peace action. And so thank you very much. Because we're going to get this done. We're going to get it done, and it's, nothing's easy, nothing's easy. But if you keep the push and the agenda and the work and the sacrifices that you all are making, 
we're going to end the war in Afghanistan. But once we end it, you, let me tell you, we've got to also repeal that authorization to use force because you know what? That authorization, okay, that was a blank check for a war without end, but also this was a blank check for any president, any president to spy on Americans, to indefinitely detain suspects in Guantanamo, to target Americans for assassination without trial. That's this broad resolution, mind you, that we're dealing with. And so unless this authorization is repealed, this president or any president will have the authorization to do whatever as long as they can justify to themselves, really, because they don't have to come back to Congress to, to ask for anything. So it cannot be allowed to stand. We must repeal it now. And so thank you for your help. We spent $7.6 trillion since the 9-11 attacks on security, including more than $1 trillion on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. $750 billion plus defense budget. You talk about deficit reduction, you know, first place we need to look is this pl bloated military Pentagon budget. That must be on the table. That must be on the table. And I'm very pleased with, again, Peace Action helped us uh, send this letter around. Congressman Barney Frank and I, we forwarded a letter to this deficit committee. And we said, and I just want to read you a little bit about what we said. We said that uh, any charge in Congress on deficit reduction, we must insist that cuts to the bloated defense spending be included in this deficit deal. All right. We said that, we had 40 members sign that letter, some Republicans, a couple of, maybe three or four Republicans. We identified more than one trillion dollars in cuts to outdated Cold War era weapon systems that were intended, and you know this, the systems for a Soviet uh, enemy that no longer, of course, exists. Uh, and the wasteful stationing of troops in Europe and East Asia that can and should be scrutinized. Plus, we can save money by simply auditing the Pentagon to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. Just ask them to, every year I try to get them to audit the Pentagon budget. No. Can you imagine? Yet they're, uh, they audit people on TANF every day and, <laughs> and go after those, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So we must make them audit. Because there's, we know, and we said this in the letter, there are 30 to 50 billion dollars in money that's just been lost. <laughs> we don't even know where it is in terms of uh, Iraq and in terms of much of the, uh, just transferring cash over there. You know, they, they send it in cash. And, um, suitcases. And so th this is serious. And so please communicate with your representatives to join us in this effort to let this deficit committee know they must put the Pentagon and, and some serious defense spending cuts on the table. Finally, let me just mention poverty. And you know what's taking place because this is part of our struggle for peace and justice. Poverty rates are off the scale now. Off the scale, 48 million people now living in poverty. Poverty rates in the African American community and among children, 40% African American children, Latino children, Asian Pacific American children, communities of color. This is really um, serious. And middle income people are falling into the ranks of the poor. We've got to protect the safety net in these deficit committee discussions. Food stamps, and I mentioned earlier right now in this wonderful art gallery I, is, is beautiful and the food I wish I could taste tonight, but I'm on the food stamp cha challenge. It looks great, especially the paella. And uh, seven or eight of us in Congress to make the point about don't cut food stamps and, and in fact the supplemental um, nutrition assistance program, but rather increase because so many people who are eligible don't even apply for them because either they're ashamed, they don't know where to go. But we have a major problem in terms of food security in our country. So we're taking the food stamp challenge. So for a week, I can only eat off of $4.50 a day, which is what people on SNAP eat off of. One person, $31.50 a week, $4.50 a day. It's about $1.50 a meal. That is really hard. This is my second day, although I did it three years ago. And in fact, I was on food stamps. 
when I was working with Shirley Chisholm and raising two single kids, two little kids as a single mom on public assistance. And so I was ashamed of it. I didn't even talk about it until I took this challenge three years ago. I did not want anyone to know I was on welfare or food stamps. But most people don't want to be on food stamps. It's a bridge over troubled water. It's something to help them get through the, the pain of the depression. And it's something that our government should support and not cut because people need to eat and they need nutritious food and there's hardly any way off of 450 a day you can eat nutritious food. And so I've joined with uh, many faith leaders in taking this challenge again for seven days and we do have, I think it's now eight members of Congress who are on the food stamp challenge. And we want to make the point that do not cut food stamps. In fact, we want more money into the food stamp uh, budget. And I know Senator Sessions and the politics of this is going to take over pretty soon. So just be very, in terms of our justice agenda, remember uh, there are people who have been treated very uh, unjustly in this recession. And more people are falling into poverty. And they need to be able to eat until we can help create jobs so they can get a a good living wage jobs with benefits and can reignite the American dream for themselves and their families. So please help us do this. Finally, let me just say um, this, this um, calling that the Occupy movement uh, is mounting is really a calling. They're calling us to action. They're calling us to action. Our belief in peace and justice um, should give us cause for hope, but give us cause also to renew our commitment and our work and our action and our activities. And so I know all of you are in for the long haul to end this war in Afghanistan, are you? That I, I want to hear, hear you tell me yes. yes. You're going to do it, OK? Are you going to do it? Okay. And are, are you in to help us uh, fight poverty uh, and inequality and inequality. I know peace action is, but I just want to hear it. And are you in to help us repeal all of these authorizations to go to war? Uh, are you, you in for that? Because I know that's what, that's your calling. And moments like these really remind us of what our calling is. And as Dr. Martin Luther King reminded us, he said that True peace is not just the absence of tension, but it is the presence of justice. It is the presence of justice. So thank you again tonight so much for your support and for being here and for honoring me with this beautiful award in Reverend Coffin's memory.